Ray Allen Canine. It's no secret that we love Ray Allen Canine equipment. We use their products every single day at both Van Ness Canine and at Torchlight. Their mission statement says it all to be the world leader in quality innovation for professional canine equipment for police, military, Schutzen, and ring sport. Tend to exceed their customers' expectations and deliver on time every time at a fair price. We full heartedly believe that they've held true to that since it is our go to one stop shop for everything canine, not just police dogs, but for any working dog. This episode is also brought to you by our good friends over at Dogtra, dogtra.com. It's the e collars that Ted and I use. It's the e collars most police dog guys use. Dogtra.com, e collars, bark collars, ball launchers, one stop shop for everything you need for your working dog, dogtra.com. One of the other sponsors we're proud to have is Hits Canine Training Conference. It's the premier Amer- it's the premier canine training seminar in the United States, packed to the rim with the world's best instructors, covering important topics from admins to liability to detection work, all and tracking and everything in between. There's no better place to learn and no better place to network with other handlers, breeders, and trainers. Hits 2022 is being held in Orlando in August, uh, so hit them up. HitsK9.net. We're super happy to be uh, represented by our good friends at Kinetic Dog Food. Uh, we've got great reviews from people all over the place. Uh, ever since we, we joined up with them and partnered with them, their uh, commitment to your dog's nutrition is top-notch. KineticDogFood.com. Check them out. Jim over at NC Canine out in North Carolina. It's the culmination of 13 years of experience in handling the training uh, law enforcement canines. They use real world deployments to develop their training program and run eye not only on their experience, but the current experience of the nation's canine handlers provide the best canine partner you can get. They provide pet training and police canine training based out of Four Oaks, North Carolina, and they serve the surrounding areas as well as nationally. Feel free to call them and learn more about their dog training program, and police canine techniques and methodologies. We got a brand new sponsor, man, American Aluminum Accessories. Uh, my entire time in canine and ever since I've been involved in the dogs, the kennel in the back of our cruisers has always been American aluminum. Uh, check them out. Uh, we're so happy to have them on here. Easy rider online.com easy rider online.com for everything you need from American aluminum accessories. Speaking of kennels, once you get out of the car, you got to have somewhere to put them. So our friends up in Ohio at horizon structures, make a one-stop shop for kennel. If you want a two dog kennel, or if you want a, 20 dog kennel they got you covered they get those things built and they drop it off at your house all you gotta have is a pad electricity and water and you can put dogs in it that day horizon structures can build you anything from mild to wild and it is the one-stop shop and you don't have to swing a single hammer so hit them up horizonstructures.com all right everybody we're working dog radio broadcasting the bike we are back Uh, another great episode um with i am from i'm eric stambro from canton ohio uh, sitting in my bedroom with a pet German Shepherd on place who bit me a couple of days ago. So this, uh, I might be doing this on YouTube. If you're looking, looking over here quite a bit uh, with me as always from Tulsa, Oklahoma is Ted Summers. Ted, what's going on? Uh, today is the hottest day in like the last 16 months in Tulsa. Uh, and I can tell um, <laughs> it poured rain yesterday and then the sun came out. So it's like a sauna. It's, and awesome uh yeah so we're in a, and as many um, we're in a started today we're right. in a, like a 74 75 degree max yeah. out for about a week i think it's because of the hurricane um yeah. it's well, when you're pretty nice when your fucking lake freezes over this winter don't cry about it <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're gonna post those pictures on instagram and be like oh i can walk across it i'm like ah oh, that sucks <laughs> i'll do it for five minutes and then back in the house yeah, no shit. So I in the hundred and however I don't know what episode, depending on what order we air these in. This is like one forty or fifty or something. Uh, this is the first time I've had my dog out. So my dog is laying in the floor, my stupid Malinois. So uh nice. yeah, if you see me looking to the side, uh he's asleep though. He's fucking he's old and he's still a shithead, but he's he's asleep. So uh other than that, I'm just got pet shit. I I got a uh regional training day with a bunch of law enforcement guys on friday that i'm taking my interns to um so i got the murder weenie we have a bunch of pet dogs um we're working a bunch of our um single purpose explosive and narcotics dogs too but other than that it's uh <laughs> working in the morning so oh and i'm finishing up the deer tracking dog 
which has been interesting. Uh, I have a Griffin, or what is she? A wire? I don't know what the. She looks like a GSP with like the wired like wire. That one. She's one of those. Mm-hmm. And so I'm teaching her to track deer. I did all of her off leash obedience, and the people that own her have like a couple hundred acres south of here. And they have like a private. I don't know. They wanted to track deer. I'm like, oh, all right. So that's been an interesting process because uh, I don't hunt. So there's that. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, she's doing great. I mean, she, I, I know what the odor is. So I'm, but other than that, it's just hot. I'm waiting for summer to end. <laughs> what about you? Uh, uh, we have one work, one canine left in the kennel from before I take my little break and I sold him today. Um, to a department in South Carolina, they're going to, it's been a kind of a race to see. So I, I quoted him to five departments, I think two vendors. Yeah. And uh, it's a race to see whose admin are, are less douchey and can get their shit done. And this agency got it today. Somebody called me about him. One of their handlers. Cause I sold them a dog before I said, I got this dog. He's darn near finished. Here's the price. I said, but here's the thing I need to know today. If not, I, I'm, I'm just tired of waiting. Um, and they, their captain called me within two hours because we'll take him. I was like, done. Um, so I have to call back some other people and say, sorry. There was Our buddy Byron was trying to get him, but their agency had to go to council. And, and I'm like, listen, I'm, you should ha- police departments, if you're listening, have your ducks in a row before you call the vendor. It's like buying a house. Go get pre-approved. Have your shit ready to go. Don't come to me and say, you like this dog. You need to go to your um, county commissioners and have them read it three or four times. Now nah. I'm out. I'm done. I'm yeah. done dealing with that. So anyways, he, yeah. Vinny will be, the guy's going to come up. The handler's an experienced handler. So he's going to bang up here next week for about 10 days. Uh, it's just a familiarization. This dog is literally plug and play. He'll, he'll go home. Him and his unit will finish. Which one? Get him Vinny. Yeah, 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 he'll get him ready for. Um, Shit, he's almost done. <laughs> yeah, he, he is. He yeah. could, fucking start yeah. him on cars Monday. He's already wrapping up, working a full car. So, um, tracked a half mile yesterday. Um, he's he's good though. He's good. We got to teach recall, bite out, which I started today is easy, and um, something else. But we started his halfway down today for the certification where he's got to stay for two minutes and then come and you down him halfway. He, he did it the first try. So he's easy. Uh, and then the other dogs that I'm training for our buddy, Scott down at uh, next level kennels, they're about done. I, I'm going to have him come up in a, in a week or so, two weeks and get them. Then there'll be no working dogs in the kennel till November. I'm sticking to it. I've already passed. I've already passed on agencies buying dogs. I said, I need a break, man. I can't clean up any more poop. I can't do it yeah so what what uh what do we got going on today well today uh it's kind of a continuation of the episode that we just posted um that while it is in line from this one uh right before this one um with the um ron from uh the vietnam era and telling a story about using a fucking 45 and a six foot leash <laughs> so Nuts. uh yeah and he's you know and he taught he, towards the end of the interview he explained like the background and like he's now in the background of the whole of, of that foundation so we have the current um and marine handler um which we're going to talk about that program and everything that he did with that plus um the foundation continuing like the modern where that's going but um tonight we have chris willingham on uh chris what's going on man i'm uh, doing good doing good appreciate y'all having me on have an opportunity to spread awareness about our organization yeah for sure we're super stoked to have you guys on um so give us a little bit of your background like pre um foundation and we'll kind of work our way from there yes sir so i was uh i was born and raised in tuscaloosa alabama and i've Served in the Marine Corps for 20 years, from 1999 to 2019, and 17 of those years I was in K9. So whether it was a handler, uh, trainer, or instructor down at Lackland, uh, kennel master, and then ended up the the program manager for the Marsoc NPC program uh, before I retired. Um, and I've been working with Ron. I've known him for probably 15 years. Uh, I was on the receiving end of support from the U.S. War Dog Association. So when he asked me to 
take over. We've been going through that transition and coming to a completion here pretty soon, but overall it's been a, been a great ride. So you get in, what'd you say, 1999 is when you got in the Marine Corps? Yes, sir. Yep. And um, what did, uh, so you, you go through um, Marine Corps basic. What were you doing before you got into the, into the dogs? What was your job? That was, uh, so like the canine at that point, there was no MARSOC. There was no other like IDD or any kind of program. It all came through military police. And my first uh, roommate was a uh, dog handler. So I got to the oh. fleet. I've been in the fleet for like probably six months uh, before I got a chance to go to canine school. And my first, uh, but my first roommate was like, man, you got to come check out what we do. And at that point, I had no idea they had dogs in the military. And I went down to the kennels and uh, I was hooked. I was like, man, how do I do this? And mm -hmm. started volunteering all the time. And uh, I had I had a little bit of a different route to getting the K9. Like I I won the board legitimately, and I'll I'll, I'll take that to the, to the grave with me. However, there was a demonstration uh, where they were doing a demonstration for like Boy Scouts or something at the base. This was back in back in '99, and uh, one of the guys had put uh, marijuana in his truck. And that guy was on nights and he woke up and drove off halfway through the demonstration. And I happened to hear what hotel he was staying at. And I was a new guy. I wasn't canine. Mm -hmm. uh, and I drove out there and found the bag of marijuana hanging out of the back of his uh, gas tank from a, like a beat up Chevy S10. <laughs> so that was a good, that was a good start to get into the, get your foot in the door yeah. to become a dog handler to keep your future boss out of trouble. That's hilarious. So you're, uh, where did you, when you were in the fleet for a little bit, where are your floats? Where'd you head out to? So I was in, uh, I started at Lejeune um, and I went down to Lackland Air Force Base training dogs and uh, spent seven years at Camp Pendleton at the one Mef K-9 platoon. Um, and I went overseas five times, uh, three of them were combat deployments. Uh, one was to uh, Operation Spartan Shield and uh, one was to Israel, where we went over there and just trained with our OCATS unit for uh, for some of our specialized search dog stuff. So I think one thing that was unique about, I mean, just being at the right time, right place, and um, having some unique opportunities, but coming in at 99 before 9-11, uh, you all see the mission was very different. And then mm -hmm. uh, after 9-11, you start adjusting your capabilities to meet the threats that are overseas. And obviously the number one threat to coalition forces was improvised explosive devices. And so um, I think I had one of the best peer groups coming up through the Marine Corps. And uh, we were on the, some of those lead of those initiatives for brand new programs. Uh, for one being the specialized search dog program where you now you want a dog. You're talking about Ron going six foot in Vietnam. You know, now we got these yeah. off leash capability of dogs going forward. Um, and it got to the point where uh, we could even put radios on their back. So not necessarily cameras, but radios where I could send the dog forward and I had a push to talk and I could talk to my dog while she's out in front of me. Um, and for training wise, I could send her four or 500 yards with no problem. Um, and obviously you train well above what you're expected to do in combat. But mm -hmm. in combat, if you want me to go 20 yards in front of me on average, like she was a, she was a robot, you know, I could, I would always maintain that distance in training, but I was very fortunate to be part of that program. Um, because that was a direct initiative from what the threat was over in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we also were down at Lackland, we brought back the, the combat tracking dog program from Vietnam um, and got to see its growth and development mm. and success. And we got to see the Yuma Proving Grounds um, down in Arizona. And it became a three week course where you, you, know, you had to go through that before you deployed as a dog handler. Um, and it just, that course alone saved a lot of lives. And, so it was, it was a very unique opportunity looking back at my career of being able to see it go from strictly law enforcement mission uh, to full on being, you know, combat enablers and um, in to end with MARSOC, you know, where at that point you're talking about anything the teams are doing, you're doing anything the teams are getting employed. You've got to be able to employ with a dog from helo casting to fast roping or pedaling and just making sure you, your dog is, uh, at the end of the day, it was all about recovery. You know, can your dog do those things and still recover and do their primary mission once they're on target. So I've really enjoyed that whole process and seeing the evolution of the military working dog program, especially in the Marine Corps over the last 20 years. So we had, we had uh, Dustin Wynn on and he was talking a little bit about the, uh, 
stuff do you guys are doing with training out there on the west coast and uh i gotta tell you i've been fucked because i'm an okay swimmer but uh i don't know about that some of the shit you guys were doing as trainers in there yeah. you know and and as trainers you're older than the guys that you're working with right Absolutely. i work i worked for cobra canine on the west coast seal contract and i was 40 42 43 years old and uh, we didn't we didn't do any swimming when I was there because um, you don't want to go in the Coronado Bay. You'll get sepsis. So we stay. You know, I was like, nah, no, thanks. But uh, yeah, I would have been screwed. Um, I'm a little old to I guess I could have got better at it. But uh, Dustin stole me out of many helicopters. I think he enjoyed it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't name your name. But uh, yeah, we figured out who he was talking about. So um, going back to uh alabama were you a dog guy growing up do your family have dogs or anything yeah we had dogs growing up uh growing up our whole lives and my whole thing was my dad was uh uh he was in narcotics he was a uh with the alabama bureau investigation and mm -hmm. so he was always undercover so we didn't really have a uh, a dull moment in the house i mean we had mm -hmm. it was one day a guy got out of prison and came straight to our house the day he got out of prison and uh, we lived up in the country away from everybody and forced himself in. And uh, am I, I don't know how much I can tell him this, but my, he, uh, uh, my dad said, let's go outside and talk about this. And he locked the door behind him. And I was like 12 years old. Um, man, he, he taught that dude a lesson out there, in the, out there in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> Walk around and find out, buddy. You're going to come oh, to my shit. house. Come on, man. So your dad undercover was he uh, did, was it a uh, motorcycle gang? What was he? What was his? Uh, he, mostly, he worked on a DEA task force. There was a lot of narcotics, and mm -hmm. and he was the guy who would he would be undercover for a long time until he got a little too well known. Then he would be the guy who would you know work the informants, uh, work them up the chain. And uh, my goal when I first joined, I was I, I you know I was enjoying life in Tuscaloosa. I was just going to go join the Marine Corps for some life experience. Like I said, there was no. It wasn't about deployments at that time. And mm -hmm. I was going to do four years and come back and go be a state trooper and go work with my dad. And uh, becoming a dog handler and 9 11 kind of changed everything for me and uh, definitely found my path of life and been passionate about it ever since. Where were you assigned at when 9 11 happens? I, you're, you're working a dog as just as a police officer? I yeah, I was at uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. We had uh, me and this guy, Matt Pearson, were roommates. We actually had a room in the kennels. Um, uh, and we justified it so we could take care of the dogs on the weekend or some of those, uh, some of the bad weather, but it was, it was pretty nice, uh, pretty nice setup. Uh, but we were actually supposed to go up to, you know, you go support UNGA, the United Nations General Assembly every year. And it was in mm -hmm. September and there's other couple of dog teams are already up in New York on 9-11 and me and Matt were supposed to be flying up there in a couple of days and then you wake up and you obviously see the news and that kind of changed everything. And we shut down all the gates and everybody started doing searching hundred percent of the vehicles and just kind of went from there, kind of changed, changed life as we knew it. But, um, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a Camelot in North Carolina. So, uh, at this time, um, I don't, Marsoc wasn't even a, a unit then, right? No, no yeah. Sure. I mean, they didn't, they weren't stood up for a little bit longer than after that. So, um, talk a little bit about the first deployment with the dog, um, where, <laughs> Uh, talk about the first deployment with the dog um, after after 9-11. So I had uh, I had military working dog, Luca, who was a she was a specialized search dog. So, again, train a search off leash. And um, uh, we our first one, we we were just south of uh, Baghdad uh, during the surge. And it was uh, a place called Arab Jabor. And it was um, there hadn't been any military forces in there in about nine, 10 months. And our job was to go through and just clear house because they hasn't, they would started receiving car bombs and started receiving rocket attacks in the Baghdad. So they said it was a, it was a, uh, a battalion led effort to go down and just clear house. We set up two patrol bases throughout the next you know five or six weeks um, along the Tigris River on route that. And so the, it was me and uh, this guy, Corey Weems. And so when I first get there, it was just like, it was just like you talk to the young Marines about and, and just the way you kind of, the way we prepare for combat is you got to go in as a dog handler. You, you I don't, I'm not organic to that unit. So I've got to make them a believer. I've got to do a capabilities, limitations, briefs. I got to do demonstrations with my dog. I got to make you a believer in my capabilities. 
Um, like for my, my first deployment, I supported like five different units. Like you would, you would go in until our things died down and they would move you to the next spot. You had to do it all over again, make a good name for yourself, started getting by name requests for the dog. And then you had to go and do it all over again. So the first one I was with, uh, uh, first and the 30th um, uh, mechanized infantry battalion just south of, of Baghdad and Operation Marn Torch. And uh, we're going south. Um, the first thing that we searched was a, uh, it was Saddam Hussein's, uh, is a horse stables and pool house uh, on the Tigris River. We turned into patrol base Murray. And from there, uh, we just pushed south uh, just a couple hundred yards every day and just kept taking and blocking and holding as we went. Now this is like a house to house clearing and searching roadways and holding roadways. So we did a little bit of everything. And sometimes you'd go out on two or three patrols in one day, um, but just cause we're taking just a little bit of turf at a time, but I would be bouncing around from different platoons because there's only two of us, two dog handlers in this entire operation. Um, and Luca's first find was uh, on a choke point. So, I think one of the one of the best counter ID methods is your route selection. So if you're just going to tell me to get to an objective, I'm going to pick you know a shitty route just so we, you know there's not a likelihood of being IEDs there. That's the that's the mission. Let's get to the target. Um, however, sometimes the mission is to clear the route, and that's uh, you know those are sometimes end up being some of the worst ones. And mm -hmm. so we end up developing this method where well, we'd have a bird dog who was basically like a, a local national. Who probably planted the IEDs like six months hmm. earlier? Now he's we're paying him to tell us where they're at. Uh, so he would look, see if he saw any indicators. Um, he would give us a nope, I don't see anything, and then I would send my dog. And she was at this point on radios, and I could send her up the left hand side of the road, bring her back. Obviously, using some wind to my advantage, right hand side of the road, bring her back. So a very thorough search because the, the mission was to clear the route, and then we'd drive over the middle of it with a you know big buffalo just to uh, get the head the X-ray capabilities and they're checking everything as they're going as well. And we just did 50 meters at a time. Um, and we come up to a, a choke point, uh, which are obviously a big vulnerable point for IEDs. And the first two were clear. And then the third one we came up to, uh, Lucas started showing me that uh, change of behavior, you know, the intense sniffing, the tail going, uh, a little more interested in that area, slowing down her pace. And I didn't need to wait for a final response. I didn't need to wait for her to, you know, give me a, the passive response. Like I'd seen enough in her and know my dog's capabilities that uh, that's an explosive device or a potential one. It's enough for me. We're in combat. Why well, risk it? So I brought her back to me. Um, we all got at a safe distance and uh, EOD at the time, they would, uh, it, it, there wasn't a whole lot of HME being found in Iraq at this point. It's a lot more conventional uh, or uh, yeah, conventional explosives. Uh, HME was more prevalent in, later Iraq and then Afghanistan. Um, so when they, they went up there and uh, they would take a water charge and take the top layer of dirt off. And a lot of times you're exposing like 155 rounds and you can see what kind of an IED you're dealing with. Well, this one was HME. And when they did the water charge, it uh, detonated the, the IED and they estimated to be about 30 pounds of, uh, of HME buried about a foot deep right in yeah. the choke hole. Um, and so that was the first time, I mean, it, just a moment of nobody was injured. We're all at a safe distance, but a, a, a huge moment of just validation. And we put in a lot of, a lot of work, man, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and a lot of extra. The training day's over, and I would just take her on these walks behind Camp Pendleton Kennels, and I would just always put in those those extra couple reps with her. Uh, and that was a, just a very validating, validating moment uh, during her first find. And we, we, um, she was, I mean, there was just a lot of shit to find in that particular area between car, she responded on a car bomb that was set up to be a V-bid. Um, we found uh, two uh, insurgents uh, through her capabilities. Uh, we found the top IED maker in our area because of her capabilities. Wow. Um, and Corey was doing just as well. I mean, me and Corey, it got to the point where they let me and Corey help plan the missions if it was based around uh, explosives. So, for example, we had, uh, we were getting a, a mortar from the north onto our patrol base. And the general idea, thinking at that time was, well, they're not bringing out, you know, a bunch of mortar rounds and firing them. Like, they, they've got a cache out there. They come dig one up, fire, and they take off. Um, and that was a pretty common tactic back then. 
So they started asking us how we wanted to do it. And so me and Corey came up with a plan and we go out there with two different squads and we get lined up We uh, right before daybreak. And we start sweeping in the area about where the poo site would be. And Corey ended up finding a cache. Um, and that was just kind of like one of the, I mean, it was just, it was just a shitty area. You can't help where you're deployed to. I mean, guys can go on deployment and not find anything. That don't mean it's not a successful deployment. We just happened to be in a very bad area that had a lot of, uh, caches and IEDs and, and uh, insurgents in there. And uh, we, were, we were fortunate enough to be able to use our dogs to help mitigate some of those. Um, so it was a, it was a, I mean, I was balls out like in the first like, you know, 30 days of uh, our hmm. clearing operation. Our first it's a hell of a first find. <laughs> yeah, Fucking yeah. 30 pound <laughs> IED you're, with You're making believers out of dudes. No kidding. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. From that point on, they didn't want to go outside the wire without us. I mean, they, they loved having the dogs up there and I mean, I don't think they still probably don't know mine or Corey's name, but they knew our dog's names. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So when, uh, when I worked for Cobra, uh, I had, I was, I had team one assigned to me and I had two, two dogs for two different platoons. Each platoon had two, had their own EOD guy. Each EOD guy liked to do things a little bit differently. So when we were doing the workups, we, we came up with SOPs for this guy, the way he wanted to do it. And for this guy, so you go to five different units, their own EOD squads, How'd you get along with those guys? They had to be kind of unfamiliar, I would assume, with the way dogs work or or the actual real capabilities or were they experienced? It was, you got a mixed bag. Uh, sometimes they'd already had previous experience and that helped out. Sometimes they had previous bad experience and that didn't help out. You know, if they've, it all depends yeah. on who came and laid the foundation before you. So, um, which I was always up for the challenge. Like I, I was confident in my capabilities and just, you know, give me a chance and I'll make you a believer. And you just got to go in with that mindset that, that not everybody understands how dogs work and, um, and, and or they could have had, like I said, they could have had a bad experience from a previous deployment and, and you're walking into that. So uh, I was just more of a, you know, kind of proofs in the pudding. Like, let me just, let me show it all about. And, and I think going those little extra steps too went a long way. Um, like when Luca got tired and it was, you know, she, it was too dangerous to keep pushing her because now I know she's not a capability. She's a liability. I would put her in a Humvee and let one of the guys watch her and I still go clear houses with it. It was like just, we would pull up, we would take over a compound during the heat of the day. Uh, instead of just chilling out, I'd help pull security for some of the young dudes. Like, I think those little things, like you got to fully embed yourself. And sometimes you'll see guys that would use, and not necessarily Marines, but you see people use canine as an excuse not to do something uh, in combat oh, yeah. situations. No, uh, and in law enforcement. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, believe me, Eric and I both have seen that. <laughs> yeah, the weird thing with you guys, and this is this is um, it's human nature to. So you're talking about taking 50 meters at a time, right? And everybody's assholes puckered because we're pretty early on here. We're in Iraq. Yeah. You're finding some crazy shit but it's human nature to hurry up. Okay. Let's, yeah. let's, we can move faster than this. <laughs> Did you have to every once in a while step back and go just chill out or was it everybody on the right page? I felt like everybody was on the same. We're all on the same page. I mean, it was um, now when you're going and hitting a target, it's, that's a whole different thing. When we right. go hit a house. It was a whole different thing, but when we're clearing the route, just knowing the dangers that are, that are inherent with, route clearing operations like we were we were very safe about it I, I had one incident where I was um like I said I would bounce around between different platoons and I'd come from clearing some compounds and they're like hey we're getting ready to do some more route clearing is your dog good I said yeah we're, we're good for a couple bounds and I joined back up with the the route clearers platoon and um as we're starting now you gotta figure I just picked up with them uh, and we'd already been moved on down the road a little bit further from when I last worked with them the day before, two days before Corey had been with them. I'd been with them. And so when I start, I get on the left-hand side of the road, adjust my wind to send the dog, uh, 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 the bird dog, the local national is standing right behind me. Like we always did. And he starts making this God awful noise and it just makes you kind of step forward and, and look back. And uh, there was an IED behind me now. Um, and so now I, I was separated from the unit um, I, and, and I, oh, I wasn't going to come right back over the ID. So I went, got my dog and went and cleared the small, um, it wasn't much of a compound, more of a shack. And I just cleared it and, and took cover with my dog because the Tigris River, there's a sniper threat on the other side. 
Um, but it was literally just me and Luca and separated by probably about, you know, 80 meters. And then the units just up the road. And this, I mean, it's right by the Tigers River. So there's all kind of vegetation. So I can't see much of them, but I can see the front part of the Buffalo and that's about it. What year is this when you're, that you're talking about these first 30 days that you're there? What year is that? Uh, this is 2007 during the surge over there when they had like 30,000, 30,000 extra troops going in. Did so once things start going, you're bouncing around. Did you did you guys have um, uh, units start fighting over you a little bit? Like, hey, no, we need them. No, we need them. <laughs> well, you would go uh, once I left that that particular unit. Uh, you would I went to a it was Operation uh, I think it was Martin Avalanche, and that was all just uh, like killer capture missions. That was all helo insertion missions. So. Like within the particular unit you're in, like you would kind of bounce around between platoons, whoever's going out, which co- there's only mainly two companies that were rotating in the, uh, the daily combat operations. And we would just support that one company was out there and we rotate between the platoons. Um, and you started getting by name requests for, you know, for particular dogs and started getting, you know, started kind of making a name for yourself when your, your dog's doing some, some good things over there, which was another good validating feeling. And and then when it, it started slowing down, they kind of get more into sustainment ops and um, they're not meeting much resistance. They would they would plug you out and move you to another unit where it was getting ready to get hot and heavy and you'd start all over again. Um, and that's what that next that next mission was, was just, it was uh, every second or third day would just be a, a helo insertion mission where you'd, they'd drop you off at like 10 o'clock at night, you go hit a target, a whole different ball game there and then pick you up somewhere different three or four in the morning, bring you back, get a little bit of sleep, do rehearsals with the next company that's going out or the next platoon or uh, that's going out and get ready to go do it again. And uh, the one thing that kind of, one thing that kind of changed for me after that first one is uh, <clears throat> that uh, I had, you know, Corey Weens and his dog Cooper. Uh, he was also a specialized search dog. And they were working out of uh, Fob Kalsu. And uh, we were at patrol base uh, Murray uh, and he mm-hmm. was getting ready to go back to Cal Sioux. And on his last mission with me, uh, him and his dog were killed. <clears throat> oh man. He had, uh, uh, you know, I was, I was a senior dog handler. Actually he was, uh, I knew when he was a student when he came through Lackland, like, you know, a little over a year before that. And he was the first guy who made me getting off the plane when I landed in Iraq. And then we got a chance to work together and, um, made a good name for ourselves and it was uh you know july 6 and he went out uh, and there was no credible intel on this particular building and um only making an approach man it was a just a big ass idea it killed him and his dog and uh security guy named salazar and wounded six others like it was a big one uh command debt and um and so then you're in a spot where you're <clears throat> you know carrying uh you know, carry, carry Corey off in a, on a stretcher uh, to a helicopter. So that, that was tough, man. And I was, at that point, it was just, um, like I said, just me and him, dog handlers, and we lived in a, we had a tent to ourselves when we went back to the patrol bay, or back to the actual main five, five Falcon. Uh, and in the moment, you just kind of deal with everything. Man, when you go back and you finally get a chance to process what just happened and and it's all his belongings are sitting in there and it's just me and Luca. And, uh, that's, that was tough. And that's when I, it finally hit me. I kind of, I broke down and, you know, Luca got up and came over and like rested her, like she never does that kind of stuff. She came over and just like rested her head on my leg, just like knowing I was going through a tough time. Um, and them dogs are amazing, man. They save your life in more than one way. Like it hmm. was, that was a tough, uh, that was a tough go, man. Especially when it's, uh, I think loss anytime is difficult. I think, you know, obviously combat is unpredictable and losing friends sucks, but when it's someone that you're close with and you're in charge of them, I just had a different bite, man. That was, that was tough, man. Um, I, I keep in touch with Corey's dad, uh, Mr. Kevin Weems. And uh, a few years ago, uh, he asked if I wanted uh, any yellow labs. Cooper was a yellow lab, you know, Corey's dog. And so he said, uh, he's like, I'm going to raise some labs in honor of my son. Would you want one? I said, like, absolutely. I mean, oh, yeah. uh, you know, especially coming from that family. And at this point, Luca was retired and getting up in age. And we literally just started talking about getting a new dog for the house. 
And then within a week, he called me. So it was just, it all made sense. I was like, absolutely, man. And, um, and so, well, we got the dog and he's just over five years old now. Uh, and I named him Murray after that patrol base that me and Corey mm. established. And that's the last place I saw Corey for on that last patrol. And uh, that dog means the world to us. But that was a, I kind of put a different, going forward, I kind of put a different feeling, man. It was, uh, you kind of go from like, hey, let's go do some good stuff to, you want to go just take care of business now. You just want to go and, you know, I was okay going on killer capture missions and, doing what you do on targets that was it was uh it's kind of it changes you a little bit so all the, all the rest of those on that next mission it was just going out in helos going out hitting a target uh wrapping people up and then uh getting next field and that was yeah, that was that was a good that was a good run but man you talking about lost like 18 pounds in 30 days like i, I worked Jeez. myself to death i was going 100 miles an hour like i wouldn't turn down a mission and you know taking putting more on myself and it was uh I don't know. That was that was that was a tough moment. So who was uh, who was Murray? The uh, who's that named after? Uh, I don't base. I don't know where they got the initial the original name from Patrol Base Murray. Um, I don't I don't know who that I don't, I don't know who that came after. Um, it was just significant to me because that was the Patrol Base we right. set up. So the so the day you know the mission's got to continue after Corey. Uh, is killed do they send a new guy and dog over yeah to quote unquote replace him yeah yeah they did and being you know it's again talk about human nature it's human nature to compare to have expectations how what how was that relationship with the person who came over afterwards um he he was uh I was very protective as far as like, I'm, I'm not going to let you go out until I see what I need to see, like in a, a training setting on the fob. Like, let me see you in action on, on the fob. Cause I know what Corey was capable of. He was very capable, um, but it just kind of changes you. Like, okay, let me, let me see your dog in action. Then I had him go out uh, as my spotter and let him see how I ran in operations. Um, and then the day came where I let him go out and, uh, I was going out of his spotter and he, he froze. Like there was these uh, bamboo sticks that were laid across the road. Like you couldn't step without stepping on them, but they would run wires through them. And that's all you gotta do is like just step on the wrong bamboo stick and it would connect the wires for IEDs. Well, you couldn't step without stepping on them. You can't, you still gotta do them. You gotta do the, you got a dog, that's what you do. And so we're stepping off to go search a compound uh, and he froze and I was like, I was like, man, we gotta go. And they're like, can I step out? I'm like, dude, we got we gotta go. He's like, man, I don't I don't know where to step. I was like, we got that's what we got the dog for. You got the capability, we got the win, like just step it out. I'll I'll guide you through this. Uh and he wouldn't move, like he froze up. Um and, and I I just got in front and just said, follow me. We walked to the objective, nothing happened, and I never let him go out again. Um, I think the part that bothered me. I, if if combat's not your thing, if not if being in walking points not your thing, like I don't I don't hold that against anybody. I mean that's it, it, that's not normal to be out you know in front of a patrol and all that stuff. But uh, don't talk like you're a badass. And then when it's game time, like you 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 can't perform. Like that's that's what I got a problem with. Don't talk all the talk. And then when it's game time, like to go do a pretty basic patrol, like you can't do it. So. Especially after I know what Corey is doing, that's kind of that was my mindset. Now I don't give a shit, but that, at that time, like that was my mindset. Like Corey was out there crushing it for me. Corey was setting the tone, setting a great standard for K9, and then I got someone coming in talking about how they're going to do this and that, and then pretty basic operation and you know, froze up on me. So uh, I mean, that's how you get people killed. I was like, you got to trust your capabilities. You got to be confident in what you're doing out there. You got to, you can't be taking a step every 30 seconds like you got to go these guys gonna do this mission with or without you you got a capability um so it's not for everybody so he i never send him back out again yeah it's tough man that's uh what's that everybody wants to be a gangster until it's time to do gangster shit, gangster shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. it's the same i mean it's it's a broad stroke but it's a pretty same thing it's just like in law enforcement where when you're interviewing for your job They'll ask you, do you think you could use deadly force, blah, blah, blah. And everybody says yes. 
Yeah. And in my time in my department, there were a lot of dudes who froze, yeah. uh, who didn't, who should have got lucky. They're lucky they didn't get killed. Um, we have, I have one guy that I knew I thought was a pretty shit hot cop, man. He probably should have shot five people. He did zero and he couldn't do it. Just wasn't in him. Yeah. So, and granted that's not Iraq and that's a whole different ordeal, but still, um, so yeah, free, freezing up. It, it, you think you can do it till the shit, till it's there. And then you'll Absolutely. know if you can do it or not. So yeah. All right, we're going to go ahead and take our first break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about uh, Luca and um, how the rest of her deployment went and how she unfortunately became one of the most famous dogs that has ever <laughs> worked for the U.S. military, basically. So we'll be right back. We have a long-standing relationship with the guys over at HITS Canine Training Conference. Uh, it's truly America's premier canine seminar. It is the largest. It is the best. Um, they cover every important topic in the canine industry. Hundreds and hundreds of vendors, thousands of canine people there. Everybody you know in this industry is there. Ted and I will be teaching. HITS 2022 is being held in Orlando, Florida, August 16th to the 19th. Also, check out their website, hitscanine.net. They have other classes that they're putting out online, uh, Zoom classes and all kinds of other things. They're offering in-person classes leading up to HITS 2022, Orlando, Florida, August 16th to the 19th. Check it out, hitscanine.net. Everyone knows me, knows that I live on chicken nuggets and Coors Light. So uh, that doesn't mean your dog should, though. Um, our friends at Kinetic um are make it a, a point to fuel working dogs and they know that it can be tough and they need high quality food unlike me to give them energy and the nutrients that they require i just subsist on air and you know for his life but so, but the dogs can't they actually have to work so for that we asked kinetic and kinetic has come up with a great balance of healthy meats and grains and is made specifically for working and sport dogs they have a full line of foods and supplements available and they've been working for, to perfect their line for thousands of dogs and hundreds of departments across the U.S. You can buy it locally online or at Tractor Supply, or you can get it at Chewy. So head over to their website, kineticdogfood.com, 513-615-6904, and get them on the socials at Kinetic Dog Food. So probably the number one product I've ever advertised for or used that set that does what they say is quick turn by vet care. Uh, I have it uh, at my house. I have it at the kennel. I have it at the fun house. I have it at the uh, doggy daycare. I have my trainers have it at their house. It is unbelievable how it works. You guys have all heard Ted and I talk about it, how we've gotten tagged by dogs or dogs do, you know, if you're dealing with working dogs, weird stuff happens, right? It's cuts that how the hell that happened bites, scratches, all kinds of things that happen, especially if you're doing anything in the wooded area, they get tore up. Uh, the quick derm by vet care. It is no exaggeration. It is great. So once daily treatment for any skin condition or small wounds to help stop little issues from becoming big ones comes in sprays, ointments, or dressing. Quick derm is great at creating a protective barrier and promoting wound healing. The best thing too is they have a discount code. Get on their website, vetcare.us. That's vetcare.us. Put in the discount code 10WDR in capital letters, 10WDR for 10% off your first order. These next guys uh, have actually been on the show when we instructed at uh, the first uh, Tripwire conference down in Florida. Uh, Jim O'Brien was a guest on the show. Uh, and he runs NC Canine, who has now come onto the show as a sponsor. Um, Jim's been around for quite a long time, about 13-ish years, uh, with experience handling and training law enforcement canines. Um, he uses real-world deployments to develop training program and not rely only on their experience, but current experiences from most of their national canine teams and handlers to provide the best canine partner that you guys can, can purchase. They provide pet training and police canine services based out of Four Oaks, North Carolina, and they serve the surrounding areas. Feel free to give Jim a call, a text, carrier pigeon, however you want to get a hold of him uh, to, to talk to him about police canine training or pets and techniques and methodologies. So hit him up at 919-438-0141 or J O'Brien. That's J O B R I E N at N C letter K number nine dot U S check the show notes. We'll put it there. All right, everybody, we're back. Working Dog Radio broadcasting the bite. 
uh, with Chris Willingham. We're um, talking some pretty heavy shit from uh, the surge around that time, handling dogs over there. So you're out there with Luca. Um, I think I read you did like 400 missions with that dog or something. Yes, sir. Well, she did 400 of them and I did most of them with her. She had a second handling. So mm. uh, Luke and I did uh, two deployments to Iraq. And then when it came time uh, for Luca to go to another handler, I was in a fortunate enough position to be able to select, select the handler to take over for her. Um, so I was at Camp Pendleton, California, and to, uh, to kind of backtrack just a little bit, in 2010, I was able to take uh, 30 dog teams from uh, Camp Pendleton, Afghanistan. It was the largest group of dog wow. teams from one uh, one platoon since Vietnam. Like it was a uh, just a great group of Marines. Like I think the average age was like 21 years old. Just a they were hungry. I mean, they fire were, breathers. Yeah, yeah, they were just they were hungry, man. They they went over there, young fellows, and came back grown men. Like they were. It was a that was probably the the you know as you come up through the Marine Corps, like the higher rank you get, it becomes less and less about you and more and more about your Marines. Uh, that was like a, a switching point in my career where it stopped being about me and started being about them. And just, I couldn't, I couldn't say enough about the the men, the men I served with on that deployment. Uh, but one of them was Juan Rodriguez. Uh, he had a, a, a dual purpose dog at the time and spent most of his time with recon, uh, performed incredible in combat. And we get back from that deployment and uh, uh, he, was, he was my number one choice to take over for Luca and be her primary handler going forward. So he went to SSD school, specialized search dog school to get the capability. And then him and Luca paired up and, um, and they, I mean, they made a great team. I mean, one had the same mindset. He was a great in the training environment, great in combat. And uh, at this point I'd been in that platoon for four years and which is pretty long for, for Marines not moving. And, uh, I need a little break from deployment. So in the Marine Corps, you do B billets. You can be your main three or, you know, drill instructor, recruiter, or embassy duty. And I volunteered for embassy duty. So I went over to Helsinki, Finland, and I was in charge of the internal security for the, the U.S. Embassy over there. So the week that I went to uh, Finland, my old platoon went back to Afghanistan, which included Juan and Luca. And uh, I mean, they did, they, did a, they did a great job over there. And uh, he had multiple fives with her and he was with the seventh group. And uh, on March 23rd, uh, 2012, they left the tree line going towards a compound and Luca's out front and she located an IED. And, uh, you know, where there's one, the idea is like, where there's one, there's two, where there's two, there's three. There's my known threat, like where are my unknown threats now? So you can't just get locked in on, on what you just found. You know, you mark that one and start looking for secondaries whether it is an ambush, whether it's secondary IEDs, like just everybody can't focus on the one known threat. So Luca starts looking for secondaries and unfortunately one detonated. And that was um, a rather, rather small one, but it was enough to take off her front left uh, paw and cause some pretty good damage to her um, left leg. And, and one, to his credit, I mean, his, your Marine, I mean, that's, your, that's a Marine, that's not a dog, that's your, you know, that's when your fellow Marines, his training kicks in uh, and he runs up and, uh, helps stop the bleeding and then picks her up and runs her back to that tree line. Uh, and then the medic on the team helped them uh, uh, get the secure, stop the bleeding and got a medevac within 10 minutes and uh, got the dog and one out of there. She was off leash and nobody else was injured. I think the most important thing, like, you know, they went to, they stopped by at Leatherneck, but at that point there was nothing they could do there. Like, she's, she's wrapped up, she's stable, like, uh, all, they saved her life on the battlefield. One's quick action saved her life. Um, and then they uh, ended up doing the surgery in Afghanistan. And they, because of the amount of damage, they decided to move the, remove the whole front left leg. Um, they could have just taken it a little bit lower, but they said that just for stability reasons and some of the damage was a little bit higher, um, that it was gonna be better for her just to go ahead and remove it. Plus there was no damage up in this joint area so they could make the cut exactly like they wanted to. and just remove the whole thing. So that's what they did. And um, I mean, she was walking in 10 days. She didn't have any permanent ear eye damage. And the biggest thing for me is she had the same spirit that she had before. And so I, whether it's a, a, a you know, troop or a, a dog, like people go through traumatic experiences come out different. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen dogs that, you know, it went through a lot less and suffered a lot more. 
And for her to have that kind of injury, but still be Luca, still be, be the same doll who could jump on her back and do the funky chicken and <laughs> be goofy and have the same spirit, like that meant the world to me. Uh, to, just to see it was the same dog. Um, and so, yeah, she recovered well, man. Talking about resilience uh, of her and, you know, to kind of her character. I mean, she was, it was, it was, that was pretty incredible. Um, and then, you know, Watt and I talked, I was in, I was sending care packages from Finland to my embassy. So I talked to those guys all the time. And uh, one of my buddies texted me and said, uh, hey, you might, you need to call right there. He gave me enough, he did a good job. He gave me enough information, know me that it was a, uh, that Luca was injured, but everybody's gonna be okay. Like, but it's like if your son's in a car crash, like you can't have enough details. Like, I want to know everything. Like, I, yeah, and you're I, in Finland. Just, like, you know, you just yeah. told me some pretty traumatic stuff. You gave me enough information to let me know they're they're gonna live. But, I mean, everything's rushing through your head. So I was able to talk to to Juan just a few hours afterwards. Um. Uh, and that was a. I mean, I I love Luca, but my focus is on him. I can't imagine what he was going through. I mean, he. Uh, he felt bad. He felt like he let me down all this shit. I was like, bro, I don't, that's the furthest thing from mine, man. You do what you're supposed to do. You find one, you got to look for a secondary. It's like, he, one did his job, one saved her life. Like, you know, I, and I was just wanted to reassure him that. And um, after like 10 minutes, we we shifted our focus towards Luca and, um, and just, you know, try to keep it light. Like, I know she's going to be fine. I mean, she's a Alabama fan. She rolled to us. She'll be fine. She'll, <laughs> she was tough. But... <laughs> so she's, uh, so she was a uh, uh, medevac, and by the time we got to Camp Pendleton, we stopped by Lakeland for a few days, and they again they said like, man, she's in full recovery mode now. Like she went back to Camp Pendleton, and um, and you got to figure how fast this is. You know, March twenty uh, third, she's injured, and then uh, July sixth, that same date that Corey was killed, that was uh, the date that Luke and I reunited in Finland. Um, you know, we're talking about 2007 and 2012 now, but it's 2000, you know, just a few months later, uh, Luca's fine enough to, you know, be adopted out. So me and Juan had that conversation of like, uh, his his mindset ahead of that was, hey, man, I'm going to take on this deployment. At that point, she's going to be close to nine years old. She's not going to be ready for another deployment. So we're going to adopt the dog out. She's your dog. Um and that was a general understanding. However, that changes things. When you go through something like that, that changes things. So I was like, hey man, like let's let's talk about it. You know, this uh you, you were looking through some shit too, man. Like, and Juan was like, absolutely, that, that's your dog, bro. Like you're I'm I'm bringing it all back to you. Um, and so it was, I mean, that meant the world to me. And so you gotta have an escort for the dog. So of course the number one choice is one. Uh so they left from Camp Pendleton, they they flew in first class. My uh my ambassador got involved and helped us make that happen and uh, flew them uh, out of gate K-9 out of Chicago here and <laughs> they landed in Finland and uh, they said, hey, uh, the, the, she's getting off the plane and these nerves hit me because they had, they shut down the whole wing of an airport, man. It was wild. Like just, and they only let Luca and Rodriguez off and they unloaded everybody else at another terminal. Um, and so they had like some local media there and then uh, the ambassador, my family, and he's walking down this long uh, corridor, and uh, for a, for a minute, I was like, "That's gonna be embarrassing." She don't remember me. Like this goes, yeah. <laughs> like, this goes running oh, past man. me, runs up to a cameraman or some shit. <laughs> and uh, I know it's not how it works. I've only been separated from her like you know six eight months, whatever. Uh, and I turned the corner, and I just you know called her name, and uh, she's not a dog who licks very much. Dude, she came up with her one leg, jumped up on me, started licking my face, and. Uh, very special moment, you know. You're in Luca's good yeah. graces when you get a, you know, get that kind of a reaction from her. And, you know, stand up and give Rodriguez a hug, and he stayed with us for the next two weeks. And Lucas stepped, slept in his room, and I think it was a good transition for Luca. But it gave me a chance to personally thank Juan for for saving Luca's life and everything he did for her. So it was a, and then we, she lived for another, you know, six years in retirement. And me and Juan were together. Uh, a couple times a year and every time we see each other it's like joint custody like here's your dog like mm -hmm. take the leash like <laughs> uh I, I love one he's that's my dude man. that's he sounds like a dude man like yeah. wow, that's a good guy yeah he's phenomenal i can't you can't you, he's top notch man you can't beat someone like that he's i just saw him uh, a couple weeks ago uh just yeah. a couple weeks ago we got together again and we're gonna have a big marine canine reunion in november and i'll see him again like he just that, he's my brother for life for multiple reasons 
So Finland, Finland is vodka. What is that? What they're known yeah, for? What yeah, are they? yeah. They got a, yeah. They got yeah. a, They invented the sauna, and uh, and then you got to deal with the uh, long dark winters. So they got Finlandia vodka up there. Yeah, fin, uh, vodka and women. I think is what the thing is. <laughs> That's Norway. Long, but, <laughs> I don't. Know. I long or leg, Sweden. I don't, I don't fucking know. Yeah. It's one of those countries. Uh, There's so, land in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is 2000, where are we at? 2012. 2012, that's when we were reunited. Um, so before we like take a break for a little bit, um, at this point, so I got kind of to backtrack a little bit. So around 2005 is when, um, uh, Marsoc was allowed, what well, not allowed, but when the Marines kind of like stood or well, when they announced it, it was in November 2005, if I remember correct. Um, so, um, you get done with your, um ambassador or with your uh, i'm sorry with your uh embassy. embassy duty and so how did the assignment to that unit come up so i ended up going back to um uh, one meth uh k platoon back out at captain pendleton where i'd spent those four years and deployed a few times like i went back there uh um and that's where i met uh, Dustin Wynn and, and the guys from Marsoc and uh, started, we started doing a lot of joint training together for my guys at uh, Camp Pendleton um, and straight, you know, created a good relationship. And I'd, I'd had a, I'd made a pretty good name for myself at that time, just being in K-9 and, uh, you know, just a invitation like, hey man, won't you come over here to, to help run this program next when you leave here? And I was like, yeah, I, I can't see any better way of going out uh, of the Marine Corps because I knew I was going to retire at 20. Um, cause there was nothing better than that. So I, I, uh, I went over and, and, and took over the program and just worked with some absolute warriors, man. Just some great dudes, like from the trainers on down to the handlers, like just some guys that'll, that'll humble you just, so, and they're, they're hardworking. They're guys that don't need much instruction. The guys that'll come in and do the right thing all the time because they know that if they don't do it, it's not gonna get done. And, uh, just the tone they set, they understand that, uh, a bad reputation is going to beat you to the team. So they took a lot of pride in their performance on and off duty and their physical fitness, the canine training, the resources they had available, like uh, just top notch organization. I was very blessed to, to work with those guys. Yeah. About 2015 or 16, um, I was out in Gettysburg at Tripwire and I ran into the a group of those guys with their trainer, uh, the big guy. <laughs> Yep, yeah. Everybody yeah. knows who well, yeah, Big Pat. Big Everybody Pat, knows. Yeah. yeah, and and he's aptly named. He's the size of this door. Correct. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I it was the same thing. Everything you just said about those guys is absolutely true. Like them dudes were there to fucking work. <laughs> like they were working, like working, working. And you know, we went out to dinner one night and it was like, Where's everybody else? Pat was like, They're sleeping. They're gonna get up early at fucking 4 a.m. and go to work. I'm like, oh, okay, what are you gonna do? He's like, I'm gonna let them work for a little bit and I'll get up. A little bit after but no yeah that was uh no those dudes they were it was a it was an interesting to um because i was just kind of coming through and i was seeing ryan and the guys from tripwire yep. um and uh but you know we hung out with those guys for a couple of days um but yeah it was um they were top notch for 100 for for sure those dudes were squared away professional like everyone talks shit about marines like oh they're crayon eaters and whatever else and i tell you what them fucking marsau handlers were squared away dudes yeah. for There's something sure. in those crayons then if and i yeah they 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 were caffeine they were, yeah no they were they were fucking squared up because we had a bunch of law enforcement guys there at the same time um from the dc area so um and it was kind of interesting to see the difference in how special operations guys handle dogs versus how yeah. a single purpose law enforcement guy i know i mean even though you're looking for theoretically the same odor i mean it was very interesting to watch and because i didn't realize who they were at first because they weren't wearing like they were yeah. they were dressed and normal was like who the fuck are these guys and <laughs> and ryan told me he was like well ryan and josh josh was like ah it's the fucking special kids from the marines i'm like well aren't they all special he was like no no like the super special I'm like, oh oh those guys okay i was like oh shit and they were all good kids man for sure so Dude, um I, I it felt like at that point, before you, before I checked in, like, uh, I, I knew a lot of the guys, like we trained together and some of them I'd worked with before they went over to Marsoc and, um, 
and it was you know it was a level of expectation at this point for going into that job and for for what I've done in the past. But I, I've never looked like like that. I've always like you know what's next, like you know kind of stay humble but hungry. And I was nervous checking in. I was like, man, I don't, I just don't want to let these dudes down, man. Like there's a certain level of expectations of what they you know, the way they operate and what they need and how I can support them, how I can best work with them. And, uh, man, we, we crushed it. It was, it was a lot of fun, man. We, we had a good, we had a good run at it. Yeah. So let's back up a little bit to Luca. You get Luca back in Finland at some point and kind of talk about the little iteration where you probably probably got real comfortable or used to it after a while, but in the, you guys became a little famous and, started making some TV tours and things like that. And that's out of your element. Uh, how, how did all that come about? It, it, um, it started with, uh, I guess the big thing was the, uh, the, the PDSA Dick and Metal. Um, it's the, it's like the most prestigious award that an animal can receive, a service animal can receive. And it's over, based over in England. It was established in 1943. And at that time there had only been, like 66 recipients since 1943. Wow. It's a it's a very strenuous like vetting process. And it's not something that you do like from like I wouldn't do it from my level. Like it was a general who um was stationed in England who knew about this award and was the kind of liaison and then it went to the Pentagon. Uh, and then it kind of asked the program chiefs for the different canine programs. And then Luca's name came up. So it kind of came from top down her recommendation. I just had to provide uh, like statements and all you know, the, the data from my end. And then they interviewed people. And it was about a year process, man, from the time really? I first heard about it till we actually uh, went to England to receive this, uh, the PDSA Dickin medal. So they, uh, we flew over in April, 2016 and it was uh at Wellington Barracks, just outside of Buckingham Palace, and it was, uh, and Luca became the first U.S. military working dollar to receive it, but it, that was wild, man, it was, uh, I went over and part of a joint, like a NATO counter IED conference, uh, so I was doing that on the, for the most part, and then I, uh, and then I would do interviews in the afternoon, then we had the big day, we actually, she received the award, um, that was, that was incredible, I mean, that thing went to, over 200 countries, close to a billion people. Um, it, I don't think it hit me what I was getting into um, when I went over there. I didn't understand the gravity of that award and like how much it really meant and uh, how big it was going to be. Um, it, it was something special. And I what what I, what keeps me you know, what was exciting about it is I know that it, something like that is much bigger than one dog. It's much bigger than Luca. Like it's just a, it's a, it's a, she's a catalyst for a bigger platform. To just kind of talk about what military working dogs do for our country and what they do for our nation when they deploy and how many lives they save. And it goes back to my respect for all the, the Vietnam dog handlers. So it was just, I, I really started enjoying those opportunities to be able to talk about what our, our dogs do for us. And Luca just had a great story. She was an incredible ambassador to the, to the military working dog program. You know what the funny thing is, man? You see a dog, so you get a dog like Luca. She gets, she loses that leg, and very quickly learns how to walk on three legs. I know yep. fucking dudes that had haircuts that are like just thrown off for months. So it's just weird. Yeah. <laughs> it, no, <that's>, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. and we interviewed uh, Trent uh, Ranger, uh, who handled Leica. Uh, so yep. Leica and Luca, right? So Leica's the other three-legged one, yep. and she's he said the same thing, man. Like she popped up. Uh, I talked to him today, actually, and he still got her. Um, and she's fucking hopping around Florida, and you know, but it was a similar thing. And she, you know, she did the whole deal with uh, on the West Coast, and she's doing the chanting thing and some other stuff. But I mean, it was an interesting. It's interesting to watch. Kind of everybody knows Alicia had that three-legged. Uh, had CJ the three-legged dog, and we had her leg amputated. It was the same thing. <laughs> she yeah. popped up in recovery and was yeah. hopping around on three legs. I'm like, oh well. I mean, and so when they said they're going to take it because they could cut it off where it was up high, and they're like, yeah. all right, well. And everyone's like, no, no, they can't walk. I'm like, no, <laughs> believe me, they can better so, than we are at this show. Yeah, they yeah. Didn't, it didn't take long for her to have the same strength as before. Like she, we just got her a harness instead of the collar, and she was off to the races, man. Yeah. Yeah, of course. All right, we're going to go ahead and take our second break. We come back. We're going to talk about uh, the U.S. Um, 
United States Working Dog Association and kind of uh, where we're headed with all that. So we'll be right back. All right, guys, this episode has been brought to you by great sponsors of ours. Please don't skip through this. Take a listen to them. One of our oldest sponsors and great friends of ours are the people down at Highland Canine down in North Carolina. Um, I really like them. We have, we see them at all the conferences. I know a lot of people have been to their school for dog trainers. They've been on the podcast Highland Canine. They're a full service canine and pet dog training business where they can train you to be a trainer. They can get you a dog. They have handler classes. They have supervisor classes. They have trainers courses for just LE. They have them for anybody who wants to be in, uh, in the dog business, be a dog trainer of any kind. Um, Check them out. Their website is tacticalpolicek9training.com, tacticalpolicek9training.com. If you are smart, you'll go down there in the winter. It is North Carolina. It is warm. You get to work dogs. It's no, no joke school, guys. You're not going down there for a month um, and, and rushing through it. They're actually trying to make you real deal dog trainers. Uh, tacticalpolicek9training.com. Next is a sponsor that's been with us for quite a while, uh, Dogtra. I love Dogtra stuff, and they continually keep bringing out new products. Uh, one of the things that I've been using a lot lately is the new Tone Box. If you're a pet trainer or if you train a lot of police officers, and I harp at my guys all the time about timing, and this thing literally kind of pairs to the, to the remote, and when you're using the remote, whether you're using Nick Constant or Vibrate, it makes a noise. So you can get the timing down 100% consistent. And so I can demonstrate how to do an out with an e-collar immediately, quickly. And it is so effective that I can't believe that it took me forever to figure it out <laughs> that, mm -hmm. to get that. They've also got these new um, comfort feather, like titanium things that go on the collars that uh, are fantastic for making sure we got contact. It actually has six points and this comes in two sizes and it's a titanium feather thing. They're awesome. They got comfort, comfort contact points for the bark collars, the YS 600. One of my favorite things. I have about 50 of them at the kennel and it is dead silent. And I put them on all the pet dogs and I can leave them on because they have the comfort contact points and they're fantastic. All this stuff you can get at dogtrue.com. And if you use the discount code WDR one zero you get 10 percent off a single item over 200 bucks so that covers the ball trainer that covers the 1900 ask hands free which is my personal favorite for all the big dogs uh it covers the two dog system uh the 202c which i use for the two dog pet guys and fantastic so dogtra.com or go to at dogtra official on all the socials that's facebook instagram all those places so hit them up dogtra.com guys i don't even shop any other sites when i'm looking for everything for dogs our one-stop shop for anything pet dog training and police dog training hunt dog training anything you need you can find at rayallen.com they have been doing it forever we have a great relationship with them um, again they're at all the conferences you can stop up and talk to them they have more stuff there than any place rayallen.com they are amazing we have a great a uh, really, really good relationship with those guys. Um, like I said, I get on their website. I do not look anywhere else. I just get on Ray Allen. Why, why should I fill up my cart, pay it, boom, shipping. Here we go. Uh, everything's coming. RayAllen.com. And guess what? We do have a discount code for them. Working dog radio for 10% off. It's all one working dog radio and it's all caps. Check them out. RayAllen.com. I'm not too shaved to admit that I used our own discount code to buy stuff for the kennel. We have American Aluminum next. They're a new sponsor for uh, moving forward. Um, they have been around for quite a while. They manufacture a wide variety of products from the high quality cam lockers and toolboxes to a huge line of products designed to meet the ever-changing needs of law enforcement community. Back in 1992, due to the demand for safe, secure transport for a nearby law enforcement department's canine, they introduced the very first Easy Rider canine. They have continuously grown and expanded products, catering to the needs and wants of the valued customers and high profile clientele. Over the years, as the needs have changed, they have evolved and expanded their products to include inmate transport systems, canine training aids, canine inserts, contraband, containment and animal control systems, just to name a couple of things. So you can find them at easyrideronline.com. That is easy echo Zulu rider online. Dot com. You can find them on the socials at American Aluminum Accessories, and then you can hit them up toll free 1-800-277-0869. You don't have to worry about writing all that down. We're going to put it in the show notes. So just scroll down to the bottom, write it down, click the link, takes you straight there out into your phone. 
Our first sponsor we ever had. He's been, he's our ride or die. He's been with us since the beginning is Arno over at ALM K9 equipment. His stuff is so good. Ted, you know, gets suits. He, and listen, Ted's suit, he's had it for a long time. Arno's fixed it. He's uh, taken a million bites on it. It still holds up. The thing's amazing. I've got a suit from him. I love it. Use it all the time. Uh, but the main thing that I really love about Arno is his hidden sleeves are ridiculously amazing. They are the best. And his tugs. I usually buy tugs from Arno by the box load. He'll send me a whole bunch of them. I hand them out to the handlers, new handlers when they come in, experienced handlers. Uh, they last for a long time. They're amazing. The craft work is is great. Arno's doing all the, the sewing there. He's got pre-made suits. He can do custom-made suits, everything you need um, out there. And he's out there in sunny Las Vegas. Get on his website. Check him out, almk9equipment.com, almk9equipment.com. Discount code WD Radio, all caps, 10% off your first order. Check them out. All right, everybody, we are back. Working Dog Radio, broadcasting the bite. Hopefully, you did not skip through the commercials. I know you did, though, because yeah. I do. So <laughs> go to the bottom, scroll down, and read our show notes and get all the discount codes. Yeah. Check out, support our sponsors. We have great people in there. If you're an officer looking for a kennel, we get a couple kennels in there uh, all over the place uh, in the country. You can We can get you a dog. You go take a look kennels vet care stuff everything go go check out our sponsors so we're with chris willingham um who was i think we're on fox news and everybody with uh with all that stuff that had to have been uh a little crazy but uh so we talked um with ron in the last episode you guys heard about the united states uh is it war dog association war dog association yes war dog association he was the president from the onset. Um, you now have taken over the reins. How did you get involved? How did you hear about them? So I was, uh, I've known Ron for probably about 15 years now. And uh, it started off just being on the receiving end of, of care packages from the U.S. War Dogs Association and um, exchanged emails. And, and I, I knew him for years over email before I actually met him. And, uh, but yeah, it started just being a, benefactor of the you know the generous support from the u.s war dog association and kind of went from there what were they sending you particularly in your gift bags man he, he would usually send some of the best ones uh it was more practical gear that you would need from i mean everybody you can't have enough baby wipes overseas and <laughs> uh but it was uh it was, it was, uh, the best part was, uh, no dog treats. Uh, I never got any dog treats from him, which was nice because yeah. you usually have about a connex full of dog treats. You can't feed your dogs because they're on a limited diet. Yeah. Uh, but he gave us, uh, one of the biggest things I would say is we were getting ready to go, uh, to Afghanistan and we didn't have the best tracking harnesses. Um, like they were pretty shit and they were falling apart and to go through your supply sometimes is very difficult and trying mm -hmm. to convince a non K9 officer, the importance of having a good tracking lead or a good tracking harness. Um, so I reached out to Ron and he provided me four high quality tracking harnesses right before we went to Afghanistan. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Sometimes the lowest bidder is not the best. Uh, you know, when, when <laughs> places are trying to, you know, stock up on stuff without even asking. Correct. Um, well, this looks good. Yeah. This thing here. Yeah. This was made in china and falls apart within a week yeah he, so. he took care of it. he took like specialized like requests like whatever you needed like it was from cones to uh you know to the harnesses to leads like whatever you needed like he was he wanted to make sure you had the tools necessary to do your job so it was it was always really good care packages so ron was telling us about a couple of uh memorials that have been built uh, I think one in New Jersey and the other one um, out at uh, Arlington. You want to talk about those for us? Yeah, it all started with the one in New Jersey. I mean, you got this, you know, reunions are, are a little more commonplace these days, but back then, and the, like even in the 90s, there still wasn't a whole lot of like Vietnam reunions. And, and it was in the 90s when they started having a couple of them. And uh, it was five Vietnam dog handlers, including Ron, who met at a reunion. They didn't serve together and they represented three branches of service, but they had that common bond of canine. It kind of brought them together and they started talking about like what they wanted to 
you know, vision of like to more, again, this is the 90s, so it's before 9-11. What can we do to honor, uh, you know, the military working dogs of past, the war dogs of past? And so they came up with this idea of that, uh, the monument, it's up in uh, Northern Jersey. And they took like, it took like six years to, to raise the money for it. Um, and they were doing like grassroots stuff, going to, you know, local shows and setting up booths and um, just collecting a little bit of money here and there. And, and then, they, and then when they started, it was in 2000. And then obviously you got 9-11, you start deploying dog teams. So they started sending care packages. And it was kind of like, uh, you know, the, the initial mission, what they set out for was to dedicate this monument. Uh, which represented the war dogs. Well, now, now you got dog teams in Iraq and Afghanistan. You're sending care packages, and I'm like, man, we got something special here. We can't, you know, we can't just roll up the flags now. Let's let's see what we can do here. Um, and that kind of that's where the program has grown over the last 14 years, and it is you know just been a you know practical support for military dogs. But the the one down in Arlington was pretty special because it recognized uh, female dog handlers in service. Um, we had a chance to go down and, and be part of that. And we got one female dog handler from each branch of service to come down and represent with her dog and her dress uniform. And uh, Ron got there and gave a great speech about it and, and kind of what inspired him to, uh, to even go that route, which was, I thought was pretty incredible. So um, yes, it's, it's kind of, it's special when you can, uh, you know, it's just one of the mission sets is to develop those, you know, work with people and develop the memorials just to make sure we're, you know, kind of honoring the past and honoring the present of, of dog handlers. Yeah, uh, we got uh, Ted and I both looked up and saw the pictures of the um, the pledge. I believe is the name yeah. of the yeah, sure. the memorial. That thing, man, is so we. Dude. It's incredible. Yeah, Susan yeah. Bahari did that sculptor. Like it's a, it's a, it's absolutely incredible. Is it uh, is it uh, like life size or bigger? Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. life size. Yeah, those are always uh, super impressive, man. Yeah, I, I love it too because it um it like really shows the connection between the dog and the handler. You know, you got the handler on the knee and the dog right there looking at them. I guess it's a, they, they did a good job of capturing. And Susan worked great with Ron, and they asked me a few questions about like, hey, if the dog's gonna be off leash, like, where would your leash be? And I explained like, well, if I got gear on. I'm not usually going wrap around my shoulders. You just tuck in your cargo pocket. So you'll see the leash like hanging halfway out of the cargo pocket to show us there. So they they really paid attention to detail about what a dog handler would, would be in that situation, like where your kit would be, where your gear, like how you'd be set up. Like, so it was, it was pretty special. Yeah. So I haven't, excuse me, I haven't been to Arlington in seven years, I think something like that. And, uh, you know, they, for those of you who don't know there, they have, uh, sections, like they have a lot of sections that are on, on that. Do they have anything yet or they've done anything with, working dogs in there uh, there's they're all in the uh i mean as you know it's like usually based off dates so all of our uh, dog handlers who were killed are all in the in the same section um but outside of that that uh the the national women's museum is just right there at the entrance of arlington um but inside the Ar inside arlington not that i know of but i just know that all the all the ones with all the dog handlers we lost are all in the same section there so if if Based off of this, if somebody's there and they want to go, you know, pay their respects to your friend Corey, um, he's he, they've got him into Arlington. Uh, no, he's he's buried out in Oregon. Oh, he, they, family. Like, they, and they actually, he, what was unique about him is, um, you know, because the family's kind of like what they want to do, but they, they, um, Corey's uh, granddad was a dog handler in Korea. What? Um, and so now you got Corey who carried on that legacy. He was a dog handler. And uh, when when uh, Corey and Cooper both killed, they actually uh, buried them together. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh. So they're out in uh, Dallas, Oregon. All right. Those you West Coast people, make your ass up to Dallas, Oregon. Go pay some respects, man. Honor some folks up there. So um, the the organization united states war dogs where are we headed what are we what are we maintaining what are we doing so they, when they started the you know like i said 20 years ago um every every uh program they developed came out of a uh, conversation from a dog handler which i love about it and another thing is to be on a board member you have to have been a you know a dog handler so you're talking about a true organization that's 
kind of for the dog handlers, by the dog handlers. Like, so everything that's been developed over the last 14 years was because it was just a, a need that needed to be met within the canine community, the military working dog community. And so just kind of give you a real quick rundown of the, the lifetime of practical support is, you know, while you're in the service, we'll send care packages and we've updated like our uh, care package list. We've updated like if you need special equipment, we're gonna you know, uh, be able to assist and help that out. We're getting ready to fill one of those. When a dog gets ready to retire, we have a uh, military working dog service award. So it's, uh, it's not based off of if you deploy it or not deploy it. It's just, if your dog served in the military, uh, they can you know, apply for this service award. And I think that that's key for dog handlers. Like 50 years from now, your, your dog's long gone, but at least you have, you know, your little shadow box and you got your urn and you got to, you know, something else to remember your dog by. Like those, those kind of things mean a lot to a dog handlers if uh, kind of as time goes on. So, um, and then the biggest thing is when you go into retirement, you know, I retired and I get VA benefits uh, while our dogs don't. There's no like, public funds right now to take care of our, our military working dogs in retirement. So that's kind of the, the biggest need that we uh, feel right now. And you're talking about over 1,100 dogs that we're taking care of on our retired prescription program. So you're talking about a young service member, whatever branch, and they get out and they want to take that dog that they served with, potentially save their life. It could have been a stateside dog and they just had a great run of five or six years, whatever it is. And they want to adopt that dog and give them a good retirement they deserve. We were talking about a working dog who probably has some joint issues and has some, you know, they're nine years old now and it comes with uh, some of that financial responsibility that the handler will gladly pay. But if we can alleviate that financial burden from the handler even a little bit, um, I think it helps out. And if at the end of the day, if you're taking care of that war dog, you're going to take care of that veteran. Um, so that's our biggest program. That's our biggest output is, is basically you get signed up on here for the military working dogs retirement prescription program. We get you linked up with our pharmacy. They'll mail the prescriptions uh, to you. And then once a month, we pay the bills to the pharmacy. Yeah, I think Ron was saying you guys have like 1,100 dogs 1100. on that. Or something. Yeah. God dang. That's so great. <laughs> that's yeah. insane. Uh, yeah, when that's, he said that, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, that, that's I mean, probably one of my favorite parts right now is like ever since I've uh, started taking over that part, like we've. I've divvied up like most of the programs that I wanted that one. Like I wanted to get like fully involved with this one. So every time someone applies, uh, I love chatting with them and finding out, tell me about your dog and send me pictures. And yeah, I want to know more about the dogs we're supporting. Like I just, I love that community and just love to be able to, you know, hear more about the dogs we're supporting. And it's, everybody loves to talk about their dogs. So it's always just been a, you know, great conversations. Everybody's been very receptive. So I, I enjoy that part. And then, um, so going forward, I think some of the biggest things is, is uh, uh, I don't want to change any of the premise that, that Ron and his, his guys said. I mean, they, they've laid an incredible foundation and, and just just out of respect alone, I'm not going to change anything they've done. Uh, absolutely love those guys and the foundation they've laid. I think we're going to try to put our focus in and enhancing some of the current programs. Uh, you know, we built a new website uh, at uswardogs.org. Uh, we've uh, started a like social media because um, they've we've had a group of uh, U.S. War Dolls group for years, like uh, 12 years. Um, but as you know, a group is where people can come in and say whatever. You know, dogs are awesome. Here's a picture of a dog, which is f phenomenal. But with a page, you can actually get your messaging out. Like, here's what we're doing at War Dolls. Like, here's an update on what we've been doing. So between that and Instagram, I've got a guy who runs all that for me. So I think the messaging is getting, uh, that was what we're trying to enhance, um, telling some of those stories of some of the people, which also kind of leads back to uh, donations at the end of the day, we're still a nonprofit and we, we just lost our biggest corporate sponsor. They, they closed all their doors due to COVID. Uh, it was like 358 stores, you know, that was a big, that was a big hit. So now you're looking at ways to, uh, not just ask for money, but let me show you what we're doing with the donor's money. Like, let me show you, like, these are the dogs we're taking care of thanks to the, you know, generous donations from the donors. So um, that's another key piece is we're actually working on uh, diversifying our, uh, our our fundraising from grassroots efforts. Like, we've gone back out to canine conferences and setting up vendor booths up to looking for, for corporate sponsors has been a big thing. Um, we, we're going to revamp our membership program uh we're gonna roll it out here pretty soon and that's gonna come with some extra perks or just finding out some more of the kind of the inside information about some of the dogs we're supporting so 
uh, and at the end of the day, just kind of creating that canine family and and uh, you gotta give people a reason to want to support because you're gonna see there's full transparency. You're gonna see the dogs that you're supporting and the good you're doing. And and I think one of the things that I'm I'm excited about is like right now I don't have a way to mass communicate with those 1100. I've got them. I am process them. I talk to them individually. Well, right now we're putting all those into, into a database where I can talk to all of them. Um, and I think within that, you'll find ambassadors for the U.S. War Dog Association, people who are willing to tell their stories, which would, again, just kind of lead to that cycle of, you know, good stories, you know, bringing in donations. Uh, and it's just good vibes, man. Like, I think the world could use some more good stories these days. So uh, yeah, pretty excited about, about dogs. that back out there. Yeah, in fact, your, uh, your web guy is the guest, was a former guest too, Cornier. Danny. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. He was one of our yeah. really? uh, We were in yeah. Danny is their together. fucking web guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, Danny was like episode number, like thirty four. or some shit. No, I know. I, yeah, I was way, way back in the day. So like when we first started the podcast. But no, yeah, Danny back when he was working for uh, Southern Coast. But I mean, so oh, yeah, Danny's your web guy. So my, my social media guy is a former Marshawn dog handler. Like it's <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, we got a. Like, I don't know. I don't know if you want to get in a street fight with our, uh, our board. Like there's <laughs> no, I'm good. I looked at the board. I was like, I know a lot of the names. I know the names on there. I'm like, nah, I'm good. Yeah. No, good group of dudes, no. man. Good group of dudes. Very <laughs> blessed to work with them. Yeah. So, so if I'm a dog handler and I have a war dog and things have been going good, but now the, the prescription bills are adding up and I need help. How do I reach you? So we got our, uh, everything is ran through our website, you know, uswardogs.org and, it has different tabs for our various programs, whether it's the awards program or the medical program. Um, even within our medical program, we have a couple different options if depending on what your dog needs. But the, the, the basic uh, you have to start with is our retired uh, prescription program. And that's where it's gonna get you started. Even if your dog retires now and you sign up, but you don't need it for two years, like once you're signed up, we got you. You're, you're locked in until you go direct with a pharmacy, start requesting the prescription medications. but um, you can sign up as early as you want to as soon as that dog retires. And it has the required documents you got to send us like a covenant not to sue. There's some things that we'll see to validate that it's a retired military dog. But other than that, it's it's a one form, a one page form. It's a PDF fillable form and you email it to us and uh, we'll send you the coordinate instructions from there. And it's a pretty easy process. Um, outside of that, I think the next more, most popular when it comes to medical is our thunderstorm um, uh, Project Thunderstorm. So it's like dogs that have anxiety. Uh, we've got everything from like the anxiety jackets that you can put on dogs if it's around fireworks season, around thunderstorms. You feel your, you know your dog start some dogs start shaking when they start getting around uh, you know thunderstorm season. Um, and we also have like these calming uh, tablets. Uh, it's, you know we're not smoking weed or anything, but it's like it's like calming uh, hemp tablets and, and like droplets and stuff. So we got some of that for dogs with deal with anxiety and. Uh, and then we've even got, I just sent out my first on my, since I took over my first wheelchair for a dog, uh, which was pretty special. You know, it's a dog that still has plenty of life. I'm big on quality of life for the dog. You know, it comes down to quality of life. That dog has still got a lot of life to live. It's just having some issues with the hips mm -hmm. and now he's getting around just fine. And they send you video and pictures and just, I, you know, I love it, man. Just being able to support the community that I've, uh, you know, give your heart and soul to and still be able to support the ones who are still serving or in retirement. Yeah, that's super cool. Uh, I mean, that is a, because, you know, I mean, when um, our, a friend of ours in the podcast and a friend, uh, Chloe had Doc or D-Doc, he was one of the retired Lackland dogs. He had raging PTSD and was all kinds of problems and with that kind of stuff. And she did a great job And he was when he was retired. And I mean, you know, but he like, you know, for years, he would have problems with fireworks and a lot of noises and he was a great dog, but I mean, you know, Chloe largely did that a lot uh, by herself. Um, but yeah, I mean, that would be super. So, I mean, I, I'm sure I, 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 1100 is a lot of dogs, but I'm sure that there are military handlers that have dogs. I mean, shit, one of my buddies is a Marine handler here in Tulsa. Uh, he handled a black lab named Allie. His name's Anthony Marquez. And I don't know if he's even, even knows about the organization, but uh you know anthony's a great guy and he's ally is God, she's got to be 10 or 11 i don't sign know her up. if she's not sign her up yeah i'll send him a text 
I'll send him a text and be like, hey, you need to sign up for this. So uh, he's a great dude. He's the guy that does all the battlefield crosses. He was in Sangin. Um, he was part of the unit that lost um, 17 Rip guys. Off. Yeah, they lost 17 dudes in one deployment. And he, I was over during that at the plus 2010. That was a rough one, man. Yep. And he handled Ali. He handled a bomb dog during that during that deployment. And uh, so he makes all these battlefield crosses that are um, he hand carves uh, with chainsaws. Um, and he's delivered all of them to all 17 gold star families from his unit That's over the true. last, yeah, it's a crazy deal. That's I've been true. trying to get him on the podcast for a while. They're filming a Netflix thing and he's about as hard to nail down as jello to a wall right now. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, he's a great guy. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, I, I'll send him a text and be like, Hey, you need to <laughs> Allie. <laughs> Cause she's, I mean, she's gray muscle club for sure. So yeah. Cause nobody, different. nobody that um, adopts working dogs or is the handler. There's not rich people. It's, no. it's working stiffs and that yeah. shit's hard to take care Absolutely. of. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, us war dogs dot what's that? I mean, you know how much people love their dogs anyway. I mean, now you're talking about a, a, a dog that performed that kind of a service for you, like this explosive detection or fire apprehension work. And I mean, that's a different level, man. It's and so they're going to do what they got to do to take the dog home. But man, it's just, even if it breaks the bank. So that's why we want to try to alleviate that, that financial burden. Yeah. Uswardogs.org. You can also donate on there too, folks. There's a tab for donating. This is not, uh, these guys just don't shit out money. They, they need, uh, you know, help from the, if you care, the help from the public, I'm going to donate. Um, the other thing is on Instagram is us war dogs underscore official. So guys, I have 20,000 followers, a little over 20,000 on Instagram, and I ain't about shit. I'm going <laughs> to tell you. These guys have 1,012 now because I just followed them. Followers on there. Let's, nah. let's jump this shit up. Come on, guys. Get on there. Oh, yeah. Follow these guys. U.S. War Dogs underscore official. Get on there. Follow them. That helps move the algorithm. That helps keep them in the front. That helps bring people to their page, bring people to the cause, and help them out. And uh, United States War Dog Association on Facebook. I followed him after Ron's thing the other day. Actually, I think I'd already followed him. Um, so let's get out and help these guys, man. They're doing amazing stuff. 1,100 dogs is no freaking joke. It is no joke. I have three, and I'm starving to death. because. <laughs> No, and I've got two, and they're yeah. both shitheads. So I have one. He's running around now. He's I don't know what he did. He's in the other room now. Nope, he's back. Mm. But yeah. So uh, Eric, where are you at? Uh, Van S K nine on Instagram. We are working underscore dog underscore radio. We're uh, on YouTube, working dog radio. Please check us out on YouTube. We're really trying to expand that. Ted just mouth kissed his dog. So no, I blew that, on him and he fucking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you want to no, see him he, make out with his dog? <laughs> yeah. Gotta do it on YouTube. You gotta see it on YouTube. You can yeah. see the so, fluffy neck meats. Check us out on there, <laughs> and uh, we have a Patreon account, Working Dog Radio on Patreon. Where about you? Uh, Ted underscore Summers is my personal day to day. You can see pet stuff there and police dog stuff. Um, and then Torchlight K nine, Butter K number nine, Torchlight Pets uh for each individual business and it's separated out um and then hrd police came out our next one's in philly um and then we've got a decoy camp in florida the same in october we got philly and then we got a decoy camp and then we got a swat school so all in october so it's going to be a busy month for us in october so uh yeah hrd police canine uh on instagram and facebook everywhere else so yeah man uh chris this was this is awesome uh for sure man it was like um kind of a full circle like after like even having danny on i mean early on right so it's the first circle and then have maria on and then have you on and ron and you know we've had ever you know we've had other dudes on uh, other marine handlers as well and um like alec alcazar and which was a crazy story too so i mean it's been a a super good like uh like you know, kind of tying a lot of things together, which is really good. I'm super stoked about it. So I hope that everybody listening to this goes and, you know, follows on Instagram, follows on Facebook and kind of gives support to um, the 501s that do legitimate work. So like, like this one, for example. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like yesterday when he said 1100, I was like, holy shit, that's gotta be like, there's no way they do 1100. I mean, I don't even know what that caught. Don't tell me because mm -hmm. it'll make me shit but i mean i know what like i know what trans I can do some math. Well, 
I know what tramadol and like and remedil cost, and it's not cheap. So, like, yeah. So, I mean, I can only imagine what that what the pharmacy bill is just a month. So, uh, yeah. So, good help. Yeah, um, keep it up, man. Keep up what you guys are doing. It's a great cause, man. I love it. Good, yeah. good really, place. Good people. I really appreciate this opportunity, man. Just get the word out more, and I appreciate everything that y'all doing. Let's keep on grinding, man. I love it. All right. That's it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys.